Bill said today about being gratitude. And um, I had a, per- when we talk about gratitude, and last, um, I preached here in January in, at Seton, and they were doing the Summer of Gratitude. So that got me doing some study, and um, was in India two weeks ago, flew out just um, on Thursday. And as I was being there, I spent um, three days, twice um, doing three three day blocks talking about gratitude um, and just what the team was doing here, just got to put on my heart. So I was just doing all this stuff on gratitude. Um, and then the more I talked about it, the, the more opportunities God was giving me to practice being grateful. So my flight home um, was <coughs> leaving Monday morning, lectured for an hour and a half, hopped in a vehicle to go to the airport, got to the airport to find out by a text on the way that my flight was going to be um, an hour late. Uh, which ended up being uh, three hours late. So I had five-hour wait at the airport, hopped on the plane at about four o'clock, um, hour flight, two-hour flight to Delhi, got on, getting to Delhi two hours, two and a half hours into the flight. Um, the plane is, everyone's starting to get agitated. We're not landing, we should be there. And um, then we get this announcement, you're not going to Delhi anymore, there's a storm come through. We're taking you to uh, the Punjab, um, 50 k's away from the Pakistan border. Um, thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, that was Monday night. That was my Monday night. I spent in, um, in the Punjab, right next to the Pakistan border. Um, but as we were sitting on the plane, we landed and we're sitting on the plane and um, the pilots are trying to work out what they do and all this sort of stuff. This, um, it was an interesting cultural experience to see how Indians respond to a delay um, and things not working out how they expect. Uh, so everybody decided to tell the aircraft, the, the crew and the pilot, what they should be doing and how they should be going. And so there's a lot of anger and a lot of all sorts of stuff. So I'm sitting in uh, seat 1C, which is right at the front, which I'm very grateful for uh, when I hopped on the plane. Um, but then everyone decided that they needed to use the toilet while we're sitting on the tarmac for an hour. Um, toilet, air, airplane toilets don't work so well when they're not in the air with the pressure and everything else. Um, so... It was disgusting. It reeked. I was almost gagging, but I'm just sitting there nicely. Lord, I am grateful. God, I'm grateful. Thank you, God. Um, got off the plane. And this Indian guy who actually was uh, living in um, the Middle East, uh, we sat down together and he just said to me, um, are you, like, what are you doing in Bagdogra, which is where I'd just flown from in West Bengal? And I said, oh, I was visiting friends. That's my standard answer when I'm um, in India. I was just visiting some friends, and then he said, oh, where are you from, Australia? And then we separated for a bit, and then we came back and sat together, and his first question was, were you in Bagdogra doing ministry? Um, I work really hard at trying not to look like a missionary, um, because you can tell them when they hop off, they come off a plane, you say, oh, yeah, they're a missionary, they're a missionary. Um, So now I'm thinking this face is sort of, looks like a missionary. Um, Either that, it was just the glory of God shining out of me, and he could see, (laughs) see see that all coming out, and he just, yeah. Um, But how's this? Met this guy. We had this awesome conversation. His son, um, he's a first-generation Christian, came out of a Hindu family. Um, His son uh, went to Hillsong for for one year for their leadership training. His father, um, being Asian, said he can't do a gap year. So his dad relinquished and said, oh, you can do that. That's okay. Um, But now his son is in America with the Hillsong's new church plant and I'm um, serving there and doing a master's in theology or something with, with all of that. So amazing people you meet. God's got people everywhere and doing stuff all over the place. So um, I was, yeah, had a wonderful opportunity to practice being grateful. Um, I want to share about uh, missions today, um, but very conscious quite often that missionaries can come across of being so passionate about missions that um, they come across as of telling you that you're not doing enough for missions um, and that it comes out like that and you can end up feeling like, man, um, switching off or saying, I've heard this, I've heard about missions and the, the, the switch off button can happen for local churches that we're doing our bit and that's, that's it. So um, I don't want to come across like that. I am a missionary. My face tells that to, to random strangers in India. Um, but want to just say, well, look, my heart is for local church. And I've got this, um, I've used this a few times, but this saying, um, love local, go global. Um, love local, go global. And I got that, Dan, from a, um, a hair product 
um, company in, in the Philippines, um, of all places. So I was Google searching hair product, and um, they came, that was their motto, love local, go global. So um, I thought, I can use that. That is so, so good, isn't it? That we've got to love our local church. Uh, and local church is where it's at. It's got to be loving our local church community, loving our local church, having a passion for local church. Um, but every local church then still needs to have that go global, a, a missions heart, a missions passion. And as Pastor Bill has told all of us many, many times, um, if your vision doesn't include the world, it's too small. Yeah. Um, so for each one of us as a local church pastor, local church leader, your involvement in local church, to um, look at, okay, yep, passionate about my local church community, passionate about reaching my community, but where's the global? Yeah. How is that global side worked out in your life personally, and how's that worked out in the life of your local church? In Acts 1, verse 8, um, it says, and you'll all know it, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's our mandate from Jesus Christ, to be witnesses in those places. And I love the fact that it doesn't say then, you know, so it's not Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth. Because if the then was there, we'd have a great excuse for just staying where we are. Um, but we don't. It's and. That all of those, those four areas were to be reached simultaneously, that every one of us as believers, every local church has a responsibility to be passionate about reaching their local community, but also passionate about reaching their, st their city, their state, their country, and then also the nations. In Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20, it's the Great Commission, and it says, uh, verse 16, 16, which is the bit you normally, we normally leave off the first two verses, in, which is the context of where the Great Commission was given. It says, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So Jesus has got his resurrected body. He can go anywhere and be anywhere. So they're in Jerusalem. Why does he tell them to go to Galilee? But anyway, they obey. So out of their obedience, they get up and move from where they were to Galilee. So in the context of the Great Commission being given, there's, there's this obedience and faith and response to Jesus' word. So they're moving. And then it's at verse 17 says, And they saw him and they worshipped him, but some doubted. So the Great Commission was actually given to them in the context of worship, which I really think is what Ian was saying last yeah, yesterday, that it's out of that worship, it's out of that love relationship of Jesus Christ, then all of that, the miracles and the supernatural and um, preaching the gospel comes. So Jesus himself gave the Great Commission to people who were obedient to him, in faith, they've responded to him, and then they're worship, worshipping him. So right in the centre of that worship, Jesus comes and says, well, go and, be my, go and make disciples. I've got all authority. And we all know that. We've all read Leo Harris's Five Keys of Authority, Victory Over Satan. Um, so we know that the authority that Christ has is now our authority, and we're moving in that. But then he goes and says, go make disciples of all nations. So there's this obedience, there's this great worship, there's an understanding of the authority that we have, and then out of that place, we're going out to evangelize and make disciples of nations. <coughs> For me, that making of disciples of all nations, um, how do we disciple nations? So this is about loving local church, global, so let's look at the mission side of that. How do we make disciples of all nations? The two examples that I have for that is Papua New Guinea and just seeing the massive revival that took place there, but training was a key part of that for mission, uh, for reaching that nation and discipling that nation. It was, they started Bible schools right at the start, training young men and young women to, to go out. And Norm was instrumental in um, that for many years of the training program there at Bethel Center. But it's trained hundreds and hundreds of people to disciple that nation. So, um, Training is key if we're going to disciple nations. In India at the moment, we've been going for um, about 10 years in India, and it started by planning a Bible school. Not planning a church, planning a Bible school. Um, a World Missions Faith Training School that was planted to train people to be missionaries, church planters, 
Um, and then out of that, you have these graduates after two years that want to do something but have no one to do anything it with. So then we've actually then planted, well, Pastor Barry has then, we've planted churches using these graduates. Um, just young people, inexperienced people who have got a great passion for, for Christ. So I'm going to just show a quick video. Nathan, are we ready with that one? This is an overview of the work in India. Uh, this is 10 years, um, the result of 10 years of work. Um, those who are here at Seton a couple of, well, in January would have seen it, but I'll just show you. I'm involved with this. Um, there's many others involved with it, um, many other churches from Australia and other people as well. Pastor Barry's instrumental in the running of this as well, but um, we'll just show you this, just so you get a little clip, uh, glimpse of what's happening in India. Yeah, a little bit of what's happening in India. I've got a question. Um, what is CCRC? And it's Chempasari Resource, uh, sorry, Chempasari Community Resource Centre, because uh, Christian Revival Crusade doesn't work in India. Um, and to get registered um, was very difficult, but we had to be a, um, an NGO and sort of all sorts of things. So, um, and Chempasari is actually where the, the mission where the mission school is in um, in Siliguri in West Bengal. So that's the name of the place. So Chempasari is the name of a place. Um, yeah, some exciting things happening there. Um, Eliza, who you saw in that picture, she's just a young girl who's planted a church. I preached there last Sunday in her church, um, and because it's wedding season in India, um, there wasn't so many there, but they normally have a, have a few, but we had a handful of people there, a few miracles, um, and just talked about gratitude, hallelujah. But um, on Christmas Day, they had a Christmas Day celebration, had 250 people come and they got to speak the gospel to. Uh, how awesome is that? So... Um, so they've got this culture now of Christmas Day, that's the house people go to for a great feed and they get to hear the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ, so really exciting. Uh, also Infal, uh, which is mentioned there, that's just um, last year we started a Bible school there, so we've got 12 students, um, they'll be graduating in the middle of next year, um, but with those students we're planning to plant churches all through um, the northeast, but also in a, in a town called Moray, uh, which is right on the India-Myanmar border, and that's, um, there's a lot of traffic that goes through there, a lot of drugs, uh, drugs get smuggled into, in and out of India through there, a lot of gold gets smuggled through there as well, um, but along with that, as I mentioned a little bit yesterday, there's a lot of, um, a lot of girls and, and also boys that are um, human trafficking through, through that border point into, into Myanmar and then into Southeast Asia and then back into the Middle East. Um, so they just two weeks ago, they, they caught 180 um, Nepalese um, who they've taken back, but... Um, they caught them, and in the, that three-month period, they said that um, there's been 150 girls go as tourists into Myanmar. They can get a tourist visa, no problem, um, but they haven't returned. So they actually suspect that that's, they're all been human trafficked as well. Um, yeah, so it's pretty devastating, um, but exciting. So we're planning to, plans and praying and wanting to start a church right in there, um, right in that town, which is a pretty rough town. Um, Info is a rough place. It's a cowboy town. Um, they shut it down for three days when I was there this time. They shut it down for two, two days when I was there last time. They turned off the mobile data, so there was no social network when I was there just to control the crowds and the, the uprising. The place is shut. As soon as it, get dark, it gets dark, the place is just deserted um, because of the, the uprisings and trouble that they have and the instability, political instability that they have there in Infa. Um, so people kind of get used to it, but yeah, it's just interesting because the rest of India is open all the time. You can go anywhere and there's just people everywhere all the time, but Imphal is closed. As soon as it's dark, it's closed because of just risk and people not wanting to put themselves in harm's way. Um, but, yeah, so love local, go global. We've got a mandate to do stuff in the nations, to do something, and it's a wonderful privilege to be part of a movement that has such a big vision a vision for the nations, and I want to challenge each and every one of us about what, what you can do for the nations personally. Um, I know many of you are senior pastors, many of you are pastoring, you're busy, maybe even got restriction on finance because of retirement or whatever else, but really challenge you and encourage you to try and find a way to engage with the nations. Uh, do something uh, in the nations. Um, so just a few things I've learned as being a missionary. There is a gap between the ideal and the real. Um, so you can have your ideal of how you would love to see it work, but then there's the reality. Um, and talking to many people, 
um, when I come back here to Australia, that uh, they talk about the ideal, and I see that that ideal is paralyzing them from doing anything, because situation, circumstances, it doesn't ever line up perfectly for them that they actually don't go and do anything. Um, so being able to live with the, the reality that it ain't always going to be the ideal. So one of those is, I was having a conversation with somebody, um, and they were talking about how children should be with their parents all the time, so we shouldn't have children's homes. Because um, the ideal is that children engage with their family, and they're with their family, and they spend time with them, and that's all great. Um, but, so you've got this children's home, so they're saying, well, we don't want to sponsor a children's home anymore because the, some of those children are not orphans, they've got family, but those children, if they're in their family, they won't get an education. They won't get, um, they, they, family may not even be a safe place. They're at risk of getting tra um, trafficked or abused. So, yes, ideally they'd be in their family, but this is the reality of what you've got to live with. So what do you do? Do you do nothing until you can provide the absolute ideal? Um, so there's many different cases for that. Um, so life is like that. Nepal, we're looking at starting something in Nepal. And when I was in India this time, we had four men come across, four pastors come across and meet with me. And we're talking about um, a connection into Nepal. Um, and as we're talking, they're telling me, well, you know that it's illegal to get converts in Nepal. You know that we won't be able to register as an organization in Nepal. So they're giving me all these things, saying, like, these are the things. So what do we do? Well, ideally, you'd be able to register. You'd be able to bring your money in through, uh, transfer it in through, through the banks. You'd be able to do all these things. So do you allow the fact that you can't do it in the ideal world to stop you from doing something that's it's, it's the real world? That's how it, it's life. It's what, how these people live. Um, these pastors were telling me that the government in the last year have increased the penalty for converting somebody. Um, so they have to be very careful about where they preach and who they speak to. Um, otherwise, I'll end up with in prison for five years and a um, $1,000 fine. For us, a $1,000 fine, we can think, oh, yeah, 1000 bucks. We could find something good to do with it, but, wouldn't, but for them, that's, that's huge amounts of money. Um, so what do you do? Do you just say, well, we can't help? Or do you sort of say, well, what can we do to help? Um, so there's a big gap between the ideal and the real, and you're constantly living with that tension. Um, another thing I've learned, that it takes courage. It takes courage to do missions. And I, Anyone seen the movie um, Green Book? Yeah, I loved it. Um, yeah, Don, Don Shirley, um, his story of his life. I'd never heard of him and, until I uh, saw the movie. Uh, so I don't know how true the movie is to history, but um, <coughs> obviously there's always license when they do that. But he's a, a black African-American who's a pianist, a doctor, um, and meets up with a guy named Tony who's an uh, American, Ita Italian-American. They, funny partnership, but they end up going down to the deep south um, in the time of extreme racism. And the, Dr. Don goes down there um, and he's playing, but he's getting beaten up, he's being uh, harassed by the police, he's being not allowed to eat in restaurants, there's all this stuff that's coming against him, and Tony keeps saying, well, why do you do this? Why would you do this? Um, and one of the band members uh, says to him this, or says to Tony this, genius is not enough, it takes courage to change people's hearts. Genius is not enough. All our fancy sermons, all our study, all all the things and all the skills and talents and gifts and abilities we may have, unless we've got the courage to actually go and do something with that, it doesn't change a heart. It takes courage. If we're going to do missions. If we're going to passionately do missions in our local churches. Um, it's going to take courage. It takes missions, it does. It does take that courage. Uh, William Carey said, I can plot and persevere. They are my only genius. I know that's not true of him. He was a very, very clever man. But he says, I can plot. I can persevere. I can be courageous, basically. And that's my genius. So if we're going to do missions, something I've learned that is I've got to continually be courageous. I've got to continue to have courage to move forward. It took courage for Paul I am, to say, I become all things 
for all people so that some might get saved. He says, for the sake of the gospel, I do this. This is courage. Him saying, I, I do anything. I become like people so that I can be accepted by them so that they would know Christ. And I do it for the sake of the gospel. You know, he says, I press on to take hold of all that Christ has taken hold of me, courageously continuing pressing on through shipwrecks, persecution, trouble, death threats, all sorts of things. He continually, courageously goes. If we're going to go to the nations, if we're going to reach these nations, it's going to take courage, boldness, to continue to step out, to reach our vision as a, as a movement of being a presence in every nation of the world. It's going to take going to dangerous places. We can't just all go to the easy places. Go in those places like in India where people don't know the gospel. Elisa, if you don't see it on that clip, there's another clip that she says, shares where she, go, <coughs> she goes to people's houses and she's, she mentioned the Brahmin people and they're the high class people in, um, in, higher class people in India. And, um, but they see her as low class. So when she goes to their house to visit them, um, they won't give her a cup of water because she'll make that cup unclean. They see her as unclean, so they'll give her a bottle of water. Um, but what courage of a young girl to go to that town and actually just continually, day after day, visit people after people after people, and now they're seeing converts, seeing people come to Christ. Um, but there's all sorts of places in the world that need us to boldly and courageously go if we're gonna reach the nations. How's your courage level? Are we willing to go? But it's one thing I've learned, that I've had to continually, courageously move from where I am to where God is pulling me to. So, okay, there's risks, there's dangers, there's this, there's that, but I've got to keep moving. And it takes courage to become all things to all people so that some would know the gospel. It takes courage to, you know, oh, I'll, I'll include that under the next point. To be a missionary, to do missions work, this is the thing that I've learned as well, is that it requires a relentless love, an enduring love for people, that that love for people just has to continue to go on and on and on. And I've had people steal from me. I've had people take stuff from my home. I've had people lie to me. I've had people that I've invested years into who just then take off all these hidden secrets of stuff you didn't know and weren't told. But instead, you can't become bitter. You just gotta keep loving and loving and loving. And you all know that. You've all had it happen in your local churches as well. Um, but yeah, it's that constant love for people, loving and loving and loving. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 7 says, love endures all things. Love endures all things. So for part of me for that is I've most, or ha or over half of my life, I've lived in a culture that's not um, my own. I think for the other half, when I was living in a culture where I actually looked like I was meant to be part of that culture, I felt like an outsider. Um, so, yeah, so but loneliness, separation, being different, but just being there because you love the people. You just keep loving and loving and loving because love endures all things. A love that endures all things takes time and can only be expressed in time. Endurance requires time. You can't say you're endured unless there's been time. Um, so it requires that love that endures actually produces longevity of activity, that you just continually do it. And we've celebrated just now like 40 years of longevity of, of serving in one place, but that's 40 years of love for people, 40 years of commitment to people. Um, and I want that to be my story, that I've just loved people so much that I've stayed the journey, that I've continued to move, I've continued to, to go to places, continue to be driven by love to, to go preach in one more place, to visit another town, to, to hop in another vehicle, to hop on another plane. So that, that love that I have of Christ's love for me is expressed to somebody, somebody else. <clears throat> so it's that love that <clears throat> causes me to, and I know Pastor Bill, you'll disagree with me on this one, and this story will probably um, freak you out, but um, going to a person's house in India and it was Sondra and I were together. We went to their house. We had to walk through uh, water, had to roll up our pants, take our shoes off, walk through this uh, rice paddy field that had uh, cow dung floating through it to get to this little house, which was a dirt floor. All these people lived, this whole family lived in one little room. Um, so we get, went there just and sat with them and shared the gospel. Um, but at the end of that time, they brought us a meal. 
So I have a choice. If I reject that meal, for them, it's a rejection of them. Um, so, Lord, you said in your scriptures that I can drink poison and I'll be all right. I can pick up snakes and all sorts of things. So, God, I'm trusting you here. Um, but then you eat the meal. Um, but it was interesting, the people afterwards said to Sondra and I, you're the first visitors, which meant the first foreigners that have come to our house who actually ate, which meant many of my other friends who'd been to their house and visited them actually said, no, I won't eat. Um, but that actually, it spoke deeply to them about that acceptance. Yeah, food's a powerful, powerful thing. Uh, even if you don't like it, you have to eat it. I learned that as a missionary. Um, but yeah, don't like it, still got to eat it, because if I reject it, I'm rejecting the person. The story of a, pup, a missionary to Papua New Guinea in a village down the coast in Lalaura where um, our first actual CRC missionaries were about 60-something years ago. Um, but a missionary pastor turned up there and um, a member of, who'd been part of the church, he'd been out of the church for a long time, he turns up to the pastor's house, he's just arrived, he doesn't understand the culture, he doesn't understand the significance of what's happening, but this man rocks up to his house with his huge big fish. And in his mind, this Westerner's mindset, he sees the fish and says, well, we have no fridge, it's just my wife and I, we can't eat it all, you have a big family, take it home and eat it. That's what he's thinking. So he's saying, no, I don't want the fish. I can't take the fish. And the, the guy is saying, here, have this fish. I caught it for you. I want to give it to you. So for this guy, it's, this is his peace offering of, I want to be, if you accept my fish, you're accepting me. You're accepting me back into the church. Um, even though I've done some things, I've caused trouble. This missionary said, no, 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 you take it. Good heart. His motivation for rejecting the fish was, I can't eat it all. You go and feed your own family with it. You need it more than I do. Um, that's his heart, but what the person on the other end heard was, uh, you're rejecting me. So the man turned around with the fish and left and never came back to that church. Um, the power of food and accepting people. <coughs> Sam, you can back me up on this one. You've seen me standing, holding hands with men <laughs> uncomfortably for long periods of time. Is that true? <laughs> I walked right into that one, didn't I? Uh, yes. Um, in, in our Aussie culture, you're very aware that it's highly inappropriate for me to walk down the street or be standing in conversation with someone with your fingers, not just holding your hand, but fingers linked, lo interlocked, um, but standing there holding hands. Um, very uncomfortable after a while, but now just, yeah, just a couple of, last time I was in India, I had four men our young pastors, so I was up in one of their houses just sitting on the couch and they're all sitting around showing me lots of love, touching me, leaning on me, my goodness, I'm just thinking, no social media here please, no Snapchat, no Facebook, nothing, keep it off, um, yeah, but it's that enduring love that causes you to do things that you wouldn't really normally do, um, but that's the culture, so you love, you accept, you embrace. It's that love that holds you there when you feel desperately lonely. You feel like you're an outer, people are speaking language. You, even if you've been in a country six years, eight years, but you're still conscious that every now and then you're still a foreigner. You'll always be seen as a foreigner. Um, but the love of Christ keeps you going. Um, love, love builds. Love builds pathways. So as we do missions, we're building pathways for people. Um, into nations, into places. For all, those, all our graduates, we work hard at building pathways for them into service. They go back to their local churches um, and there's no pathway for them. That's the reality, uh, particularly in India. They've got to have a degree and be about 100 years of age before they get to pastor the church because there's three, four people in front of them. So they want to do something now. So we build pathways for them. Um, time is running, so I'll quickly jump on to the next one. Um, <coughs> something I've had to learn is that I do not believe the lie that it is such a sacrifice. I don't believe the lie that it's a sacrifice because I know when I start to believe that and believe that it's a sacrifice and accept that it's a sacrifice, then it does me in because I then start to feel sorry for myself. I start to feel a bit miserable, become ungrateful. Um, so <coughs> William, Car uh, sorry, not William Carey, David Livingstone said, I never made a sacrifice. This is the man who pioneered into Africa. He made the sacrifice. The reality, if you read his story, the sacrifices that he made were absolutely unbelievable. Um, but he says, I made no sacrifice. Um, 
He says this as well. This is one of his quotes. If a commission by an earthly king can, can be considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? I think that's Paul. He says, I count it a cost. I count everything rubbish compared to knowing Christ. And that's what David Livingston's saying. Compared to his love for Christ and the call of Christ and serving Christ, all this other stuff, it, yes, there's sacrifice really, but it's nothing compared to the joy of knowing knowing Christ and serving him. So what's the alternative for me? The alternative to me would be a pursuit, a pursuit of a life of comfort and happiness, which is an empty illusion, really. Yeah, I don't want that. I want to serve my king. I want to serve my saviour. I want to do what he asked me to do. So please, no more telling me that you admire my sacrifice. I'm over it. It doesn't help me. Um, but I do have people here. Oh, I admire your sacrifice, admire that, we admire this. And I th- like, but if I start to believe that, it does me in, so it's not helpful. So um, go for it, but don't tell me. Um, so what do I do in those times when I feel like the journey is all just sacrifice? It is all just trouble. I've had to really go back to knowing where I belong. Where do I belong? Where do I come from? Uh, why am I here? Um, and then in Psalms 2, verse 12, it says, kiss the sun, kiss the sun. There's a passage there, which is a really a messianic passage, but the last bit says, kiss the sun. And <clears throat> Judas kissed the sun, so don't kiss him like that. Um, but there was a lady who came to the feet of Jesus and kissed Jesus' feet, washed his feet with her tears because she was just so grateful, thankful, just poured out her love, her alabaster jar all over Jesus. Why? She was just kissing him because she loved him so much. There was just so much love there for what Jesus had done for her. So kissing the son, doing that daily. I think there's also many other kisses in the Bible, but also a kiss of submission, like the the king. The king kisses down, it's sort of a blessing kiss, but when someone kisses the hand of a king, it's a, a kiss of submission and obedience. So it's that kiss of submission to the son, Jesus Christ, that kiss of love and affection to to Jesus Christ. And I think also the kiss that was there between Jonathan and David, the kiss of affection. It says that David kissed Jonathan because he loved him. It was an affectionate kiss between two males and it's not inappropriate, but there was just this love and affection there, a kiss that just showed absolute love for his brother, Um, having that type of of kiss with with the son. And I think that's the thing that sustains us. That's the thing that keeps us going, learning to kiss the son daily. Yeah. And I know we don't do it all the time. Sometimes we have days where we don't kiss the sun. But there's times where we need to, for me, I've had to say, well, I'm going to kiss the sun in, a, in, in submission, remind myself of my submission to my King and my Saviour, Jesus Christ. And that kiss of affection of the, the woman who just loved him so much that she just poured these tears, kiss of David to Jonathan. Um, so yeah, when I get focused on the sacrifice and I forget to kiss the sun, it all becomes pretty miserable. It's just another flight. It's another, another ride in a vehicle. It's another this or it's another that. But, um, but it does take, we're going to sustain doing missions long term. We need to um, kiss the sun. To wrap up, I want to leave, I guess, CFC as a group of churches with a challenge um, regarding missions. And... Um, a number of years ago, when the CRC had its conference at, um, at the Entertainment Centre, Pastor Barry was there, and I, I wasn't there, but he preached a message about um, and the international vision and all those sorts of things. But one of the key aspects of the message that he preached, I got to hear it on DVD, was um, him prophetically, and I believe it was prophetically, speaking to our movement of actually a groups of churches getting together and planning operational bases. So groups of CRC churches strategically saying we're going to work together to plant a base in this particular nation with the desire then to reach the surrounding nations. Um, and I heard that and thought, yeah, that, that's, that's from God. He's heard, he's heard God's voice. Um, and then just a couple of years ago, I asked him again, he preached this sermon and do you, did you, do you still believe that that was actually a prophetic word for the movement? And he said, yes. Um, 
just as I was preparing for this, I was reminded of that conversation um, and just that thought. Um, not to say stop doing what you're doing, keep doing what you're doing, but this is extra, this is on top, but to actually challenge the CFC group of churches is could we collectively as a group uh, str- strategize, pick a nation, plan a base that is actually a base to reach a surrounding group of nations? Um, <clears throat> it's, that's a long-term vision. That's a long-term plan. That's a long-term commitment. That's not something that you can just start and say, well, we'll do it for a couple of years and then take off. That's, that's strategically saying we're going to, as a group, raise money, find a man or a woman, send them to that nation, get them employed in that nation, do something there so that they can start an operational brace, start to train local people so that they can then do the evangelism, outreach, church planting. Um, but it's what really happened in India is that started a base and then from there it's spread out. Um, Papua New Guinea became a base for reaching the, the South Pacific um, 40 plus years ago or 40 something years ago. Um, so I'm not saying I'm the one and I'm not saying that I have the place, but there's China, there's the Middle East, there's many places. Uh, my heart's Asia, um, but there's many, many places, many parts of the world that still need to be reached. Um, so I want to leave that with you to really collectively as a group of churches, is that something that could be done as a group, that you actually work together, say, okay, we're going to keep doing what we're doing for missions, we're going to keep keep all that on, but actually as a group, we want to pioneer a base in a nation that actually then reaches nations as an operational base. Um, So there you go. My time is up. I'm conscious that we want to finish on time. So let me pray and then we will um, wrap it up. Father, I thank you that you sent your son to reach lost souls. And Father, I just pray that you grip each of our heart with such a love for you that that will overflow into the lives of others, that you will um, cause us to want to, to move out, to move beyond what we are doing and to dream for other nations, other souls, other people. Lord, in the busyness of all that we do here, We don't want to forget those in those other nations that need someone to come, need someone to finance, need someone to pray. And Lord, I pray that for each and every one of us, that we would find a way to engage in a newer, a greater level of mission, um, strategically planned by you as you open doors across the nation. So Father, I just pray your blessing and your hand upon uh, the Christian Family Center group of churches and uh, your call and purpose that they've placed within within them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Ben.